talk to Brad. Welcome back to Water Matters. Most people might not be able to tell you what a diamond back terrapin is, but here's a hint. Back in the 1900s, terrapin soup was one of the most expensive things you could order at Delmonico's restaurant in New York City. And not too many years ago, a group of 150 terrapins actually shut down a runway at JFK Airport. So who are these terrapins, and how are they being affected by pollution on Long Island? On this edition of Water Matters, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Russell Burke, Professor of Biology at Hofstra University. Professor Burke teaches ecology, evolution, behavior, conservation biology, and herpetology to his lucky students at Hofstra, and we are delighted to have him as our guest today. Here now is Dr. Russell Burke. Thank you, Marshall, for that introduction, and um, I'd like to continue by talking a little bit about uh, diamondback terrapins, give you um, a bit of an introduction to this species that I love so much. So uh, diamondback terrapins um, are uh, really, really interesting species for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, so what, some of the things I want to show you from this picture here is that um, this is a male and a female terrapin. That's the female on the bottom and the male on the top. These are full-grown adults. So these are a couple things that are to get from this. These are, these are animals that are small enough that you could you could hold two of them in your hand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, there's big sexual dimorphism in these species. So you know females are so much bigger than boys, and they practically live different lives. They eat different things. They live in somewhat different areas. Um, and another thing about that means that they mature at very different rates. Boys get to be big enough to uh, be sexually reproductive in just a few years. Females, it takes much, much, much longer. So that means that females have this really long period before they can become reproductive. Males are, are reproductive much earlier, but after they reach reproductive age, we really don't know how long they live. They could be 30, 40, 50, 60. Some indications are well over 70 or 80 years old. So they can live a really, really long time. And um, during that time, they tend to live in just one relatively small area. Like the turtles that I study in Jamaica Bay, they almost certainly live their entire lives within Jamaica Bay. They're not like sea turtles. They don't go wandering up and down the coast or across the oceans or anything like that. They stay right where, where, where uh, pretty close to where they're, they're, they're hatched out. And their entire lives are focused around uh, the salt marshes. Uh, so this, these, these Spartina marshes, or brackish water marshes, where the fresh water and the salt water comes together are absolutely essential to diamondback terrapins. So anytime you want to talk about terrapin conservation, you're really talking about conservation of the marshes. So they live in these marshes up and down the east coast of the United States. They go all the way to the north, uh, to Cape Cod, all the way to the south, down to Corpus Christi, almost to the Mexican border. Uh, and they live in this narrow band of salt marsh habitat along the edge of the, of the shoreline. Don't go very far inland. Don't go very far out the shore. Um, the only exception to that is in the south where there's no salt marshes, they live in mangrove swamps. But it's that narrow band of vegetation along the shoreline, absolutely critical to terrapins. Just to tell you a little bit about a year in the life of a terrapin in, in brief, um, right about now, uh, the turtles are starting to wake up from hibernation. Uh, they are, uh, uh, will soon be moving around in the water. They'll start foraging a little bit. And before too long, we're going to have turtles, uh, the females, coming up on land to nest. The females are the only ones who come on land. The males never do. Uh, so they'll come on land to nest. They'll put their eggs in the ground, head back out into the water. Uh, then the eggs will incubate over the summer. Um, hatch out in July, August, September. Uh, some of those hatchlings will come out right then and head on from there. Others are going to uh, uh, sit in the nest over the winter, come out in the spring. So we can find hatchlings pretty much any time of the year because some emerge in the fall, some emerge in the spring. Um, and some of the time we, uh, we see clusters of turtles mating out in the water. That's going to happen in the early spring. That's actually probably the very first thing we're going to see coming along in, in the next couple of months. Uh, we don't, we've got a lot, lot of studies on what terrapins eat. There's a lot of variation in their diets from the north part of the range to the south part of the range. But in general, you know, the broad picture is they eat crunchy things. They like mollusks, they like clams, they like snails, they like crabs. Um, they sometimes eat barnacles, a little bit of plant material, but that's really the majority of the things that they eat. Those really strong jaws they've got are all about crushing shells. So terrapins are also interesting because they're one of the few reptiles that have been really, really important to humans, uh, you know, in the United States and North America for a really long time. 
most people can live their entire lives and not be aware of any other reptiles or even any reptiles at all, but terrapins have been important to, to us in, in North America for a long time. First, uh, the, the indigenous people in the United States, the Native Americans, certainly harvested terrapins um, and ate them any time they encountered them. We find terrapin shells in oyster middens, you know, in the, in the leftover uh, remains from oysters that uh, are left behind. Um, and when the early Europeans came here, they adopted that practice and they ate terrapins a lot. Um, when people were hungry and that was the only thing they could eat, they would definitely eat terrapins. It was kind of a poor person's food until the late 1800s, early 1900s, when all of a sudden it became very fashionable. If you, if you had a little money and you wanted to impress somebody, you'd take them out to dinner, you'd have terrapin soup as part of that meal. And for a while, for several decades, terrapin, terrapin soup was incredibly popular. And as a result, terrapins were harvested throughout their range, really, really hammered the populations hard so hard that uh, here in New York, where supposedly the best terrapins came from, uh, populations dropped to such low levels that they were essentially wiped out. Uh, that phase came to an end, and uh, you know we rarely find people offering terrapin soup for, for food anymore. It's pretty rare anymore. You know, that, like lots of fashions, it just kind of disappeared. But at that same time and continuing on until fairly recently, we've had really dramatic losses of the marshes all along the coast. And like I said earlier, if you lose the marshes, you lose the terrapins. Um, these days, since marsh loss is mostly decreased, in other words, we've got a pretty good handle on marsh loss these days, and it doesn't occur quite as rapidly as it did before. Um, we, uh, the main threats of terrapins are crab pots. People are putting crab pots out and traps out in the water to catch crabs, and incidentally, terrapins go in. They're underwater for hours and hours, days at a time. They can't breathe and they drown, and entire populations can be wiped out very, very rapidly that way. We also have lots of places where we've built roads close to, hot, to close to the oceans. The female turtles come up out of the water to go nesting, and uh, they get hit on the roads. That happens a lot, especially here on Long Island. And also, you know, we don't know much about it, but it's fair to presume that pollution plays an important role. Terrapins are probably sensitive to all the kinds of pollution uh, that we have in our nearby uh, shorelines. So I've been working on uh, terrapins in Jamaica Bay uh, for nearly 20 years now. Uh, the study site in the center of the screen, that, that's the, the main site on Willers Bar Hassock, this island in the middle of Jamaica Bay, where I've been working for a long time. We've also been working uh, on the terrapins that have uh, shown up on, at the airport at JFK as well. So we do um, all the sorts of things that lots and lots and lots of ecologists who study animals do. We go out every day looking for, for our animals out in the field. In this case, we're looking for nesting females there on the top right. You see a nesting female. That's like our golden thing. When you find one of those, you're done, you've had a good day. And um, when, we catch, when the females are done nesting, we catch them before they go back to the water. We uh, put little microchips in them so that we can identify them later. We mark and measure them and then we release those females back into the water. We also do work with the, uh, with the other turtles in the population, the subadults and the males. So starting last year, we've, we've begun trapping them out in the, in the bay. So we use those very same crab pots that in some situations are bad for turtles. We're putting them out there and then checking them regularly so none of our turtles drown. And we pull them up and we've been catching males and, and, and the, and the subadults as well. So we've got a handle on the entire population. So some of the things that we found in the years that we've been doing this is that um, uh, the terrapins up here in the north, they're laying as many as three clutches of eggs in one year. So we get one female comes up early in June, again later in June, and then sometime in July and lays three clutches of eggs. Average clutch size is about 13. Um, and we've also found that if we don't put any covers or protection on top of those nests, that raccoons will eat nearly all the eggs. They get about 95 to 98 percent of the clutches in any particular year. We've also found that this population is declining very rapidly. Um, we've had nearly a 50% loss in the, in the total number of nesting females uh, just since 2004. Um, and we don't really have a good grasp on why that is. There's certainly things going on in Jamaica Bay that uh, are very alarming and makes it, make us very concerned about this population. Now, on the other hand, I said I had two study sites in Jamaica Bay, and that's true. Uh, since 2009, we've also been studying the population at the airport. 
Um, some people who remember that far back will remember that all of a sudden, you know, the news uh, media was, was flooded with, with, with stories about terrapins at Jamaica Bay. And um, I had friends from all over the country contact me and say, you know, you're, 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 uh, Projects are funded from now on uh, because uh, you know there's all these news of, of terrapins in Jamaica Bay. There's there's tweets going out. There's terrapins being caught by the truckload in the bay uh, uh, on on the runways. Um, there's lots of news stories. It was certainly an international news story about the the terrapins out there. And this first question, of course, is you know what's going on? What, why all of a sudden are there a lot of turtles there? We've been spending a number of years now studying that population. First thing is we know it's not our turtles. We know it's not the ones from the previous population that we were studying. Clearly different animals. And of course we know that because we marked all of ours and we look at the ones at JFK and they're not our turtles. And so um, we think that probably um, this is an entirely separate population that is, you know, turtle version of exploding in size. So we've been studying them now for a bunch of years, and I think what happened is that some way back in 2001 or 2002, for some reason, there was a decrease in the predation rates on the eggs for a small population of terrapins that lived there. So for a couple of years, all those eggs turned into hatchlings, all those hatchlings turned into youngsters that went into the marshes, and now those animals are mature and they're coming back up to nest on, 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 the, uh, on, on the runways. We've discovered that this is a very young population, not made up of, of, of primarily 30 and 40 year olds like our other population, but made up of really, really young animals that are rapidly growing. And we're still working on this population. We're collecting data on their diet and reproductive information. Um, and we're also um, uh, working with the airport people to, uh, uh, to keep the turtles off the runways. And so you haven't heard nearly so much about turtles on runways since the 2009 uh, because uh, we've worked with them to put up barriers to keep the turtles off the runway. Now that it's a manageable problem, now we can start talking about understanding this population better. So I'm going to wrap up by talking about uh, you know, conservation of the terrapins. And um, as I said in the beginning, conservation of terrapins is really about protecting marshes. So um, we really think that the, the biggest impact on the marshes locally are, is nitrogen pollution. Um, they also suffer when natural stream flow is disrupted. And so um, you know, there's, there's connections between what we do and the, and the people that are interested in reestablishing re natural stream flow along uh, uh, Long Island for the, for the, for the fish that live along Long Island. So the removal of dams and the management of dams um, and allowing the streams to flow more naturally is really important. And, you know, that that has paybacks for us as well because marshes provide a lot of services for people. Um, we know, for example, that marshes are really important in reducing the effects of storm surges when we have really bad storms. So, you know, when we help the marshes, that helps the terrapins, but the marshes also pay us back by, uh, by protecting us. And um, as far as terrapins are concerned, you know, I think it's really important that we don't feel, feed wildlife. Um, everybody who goes out there and leaves food out for animals, whether that's their local cats or whatever, you know, that's going to go eventually to raccoons, and raccoon populations are really, really, really high on Long Island, in part because we provide food for them. So it's really important that people not feed animals outside, um, that they be really careful when they're driving in areas where terrapins nest. Ocean Parkway here on Long Island is, a, is one area where terrapins are killed all the time. And also, finally, I want to point out that there's some important legislation being considered by, uh, by our state legislators right now dealing with uh, uh, crab pots to, to, uh, to adjust them so they don't catch turtles and also to close the harvest on terrapins, which is probably going to be really important down the road. So thank you very much. working on water issues on Long Island understand that we have a problem with nitrogen. It pollutes our bays and streams as well as our drinking water. Most excess nitrogen is coming from sewage systems, but there is another significant contributor, water-soluble, high-nitrogen lawn fertilizers. It's pretty ironic when you think about it. We're spending millions or even billions of dollars trying to reduce nitrogen levels in our water, 
And yet every spring, consumers flock to the big box stores and the garden centers to buy huge bags of lawn fertilizer that contain high levels of synthetic nitrogen that dissolve in water, up to 40% in some cases. And making synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is dependent upon continued fossil fuel extraction, which is increasingly dependent upon fracking. But that's a whole other story. So we're paying to make the problem worse while we're paying to make it better. Hmm. Okay. High nitrogen lawn fertilizer, that is any product with a first number higher than 10 on the bag, can turn a suburban lawn bright green in just a matter of days. But a lot of that water-soluble nitrogen never gets to the grass plants. It drains right through the soil and ends up in our drinking water supply. Or it washes away with heavy rain and ends up in our streams, rivers, and bays. So how much does fertilizer contribute to our water problem? Estimates vary from 8% to 15% or even more in some areas. But here's the thing. This is the low-hanging fruit of Long Island's water issues. It's a problem that can be fixed right now, and it can have an immediate impact on the quality of our water, and it won't cost a dime. There are plenty of high-quality, low-nitrogen lawn fertilizers on the market today that contain water-insoluble nitrogen. This kind of nitrogen is broken down by microbes in the soil rather than water, so it stays where you put it and it nourishes your grass plants slowly over time rather than all at once. It's better for the plants and it's certainly better for our water. These are the fertilizer products we should be using on Long Island. Sometimes people need help making the right choices. Now, manufacturers are reluctant to change their formulas until there is a market for their products. That's why it's time for our elected representatives in Nassau and Suffolk counties, as well as in Albany, to pass legislation that prohibits the sale or use of any lawn fertilizer with more than 10% nitrogen and require that half of that nitrogen be water insoluble. Getting rid of high nitrogen fertilizers is not going to solve all of our water problems here on Long Island, but it is certainly a common sense first step that could make an immediate difference for us and future generations. I'm Patty Wood, and that's my soapbox. The views expressed on the soapbox are not necessarily those of Water Matters, its sponsors, hosts, guests, or underwriters. If you'd like to stand on the Water Matters soapbox and sound off about a water issue, send your script to soapbox at liwater.org. This is Jack. Jack and his family live in a nice house on Long Island. Jack has a beautiful green lawn, and he's very proud of it. Every spring, Jack goes to the garden store to buy fertilizer and weed killer for his lawn. He wants it to look as good as possible. Jack loves living on Long Island, and like everyone else, he wants his family to have clean water to drink and to swim in. Jack also likes to fish, and hates it when algae blooms and dead fish ruin his fun. This is Jim. Jim lives next door to Jack. He also has a beautiful green lawn, and he's very proud of it. Every spring, Jim goes to the garden store to buy fertilizer for his lawn. He uses a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer and leaves the grass clippings on the lawn. He uses compost and grass seed instead of weed killer and his lawn is thick and beautiful. One day, Jim told Jack how high nitrogen fertilizers can help create algae blooms and fish kills and that lawn pesticides are polluting our drinking water. Jack was amazed. He'd never thought about it before. This spring, Jim has a bright blue lawn sign on his yard that says, I love Long Island. No pesticides or high nitrogen fertilizers are used on this property. And right next door, his neighbor Jack proudly displays the same bright blue sign. If you love Long Island, join the campaign to protect our water by eliminating high nitrogen fertilizers and chemical pesticides. For more information, visit ilovelongisland.org. Welcome back to Water Matters. Our guest today is Dr. Russell Burke of Hofstra University. Russell, that was fascinating. Thank you. I grew up on Long Island hunting turtles. I dug a pond in my backyard. I had like 12 aquariums. How did you get into uh, 
turtles yourself? Well, I'm not a Long Islander uh, by, by, uh, by birth. I was born and raised in the Midwest. Um, and um, I followed a pretty typical trajectory, I think, that a lot of, lot of people who are interested in turtles do. Um, I first started off being really interested in snakes. You know, I was all, I was the kid who went out and caught the snakes in the neighborhood, who who went on long trips to catch snakes, and but every place I went, you know, there's snakes, and oh well, you know, it's turtles too. And um, what really changed for me uh, was I read a book. You know, I read a book by the by the great sea turtle biologist Archie Carr, and um, he talked a lot about sea turtles and about how, how important they are to, to people because, you know, they feed a lot of people and yet they're such majestic and beautiful animals themselves. And I was just completely taken, taken over by this idea of working with sea turtles. Um, and I eventually ended up working with Archie Carr, but um, got sidetracked a little bit into this little turtle project over to the side and then this little one over the side. And yeah, and then I became a turtle biologist. And, uh, you know, I ended up not working with snakes much at all. <laughs> Uh, now, the, the diamondback terrapin uh, occupies an interesting place, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, so terrapins have become a, a, a very important part of my, my, my life now. Um, I still work on other turtle species. Um, I have a, a, a pretty long-term project uh, uh, working on wood turtles. Uh, we've been working on box turtles here uh, in the region for uh, several years now. But um, the terrapin project has been extraordinarily productive. And for scientists, that means that you know we're able to go in there and ask a lot of questions and then develop experiments that allow us to address the answers to those questions. So over the nearly two decades that we've been working on terrapins, we've um, uh, have had a, just a, a very large number of students and volunteers working on the project. And every year we go in, this year we're going to answer, uh, try to understand this better, this better, this better, and this better. And we set up experiments to learn them better. And we come out, you know, a little bit further ahead than we were before, but almost always with an entirely new set of questions for the following year. So it's just never going to end. Well, I have a question for you. You're aware of that uh, massive uh, terrapin uh, die-off out in the, yeah. the conical of uh, uh, Tuttle Creek. Sure. Uh, first of all, what, what caused that? Well... We can't say with certainty, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, we're, we're kind of like, you know, going into the, to the crime scene after the crime and trying to figure out exactly what happened. And I don't think we're, we're to the point where we can say with certainty what it is. But I think we have very, very, very good evidence uh, that, um, uh, that there was a, uh, there were, there was, you know, some, some poisonous uh, microorganisms in the water that were probably uh, encouraged to build up a very large population because of local pollution, probably because of nitrogen pollution. From? Oh, well, nitrogen pollution on Long Island is, a, is an interestingly complex subject, but certainly most of this is runoff, right? This is coming from people's lawns. This is coming from farming facilities. This is coming from sewage treatment plants. Right. Uh, these are the big mm -hmm. contributors to nitrogen pollution. Right along Tuttle Creek, you got all three plus a golf course. Absolutely, and, and golf courses can be contributors as well. So, um, you know, we've had a really bad nitrogen pollution along the shorelines of Long Island in many places for a long time. We have algal blooms as a result of that. That's one of the big problems. And this was a toxic algae. Blue and this was a blue. toxic algae, probably, which was picked up by the filter feeders, the, the clams. and uh, the, uh, the rib mussels. The rib mussels are the, pro are the most likely uh, candidates. We certainly know that there are high levels of toxic algae in the ribbed mussels. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and rib mussels are one of the favorite prey items of, of particularly female diamondback terrapins. Mm -hmm. Completely unprecedented in the sense that we've never had a, a, a been able to put those pieces together in, in a sequence before. There have been die-offs before, but never where there were people in place and to, to ask the right questions, to collect the right samples, to put all to, to try to test them all. Well, what are the implications of this now for Peconic Bay? There's uh, there's eelgrass there. Sure. Uh, there are periwinkles there. Absolutely. And without something to eat the peri uh, periwinkles, what happens to the marsh? Right. So we do know that in many places, terrapins and uh, blue crabs and some fish are really important predators of periwinkles. Periwinkles, in turn, are important predators predators of Spartina grass. So it's, you know, it's if you take off the predators from the top, you can have effects all the way down, and that can involve the, the loss of the marshes. So it's really important, you know, that we, you know, since marshes are important to us, it's really important that we protect the marshes, and that means protecting the animals that protect the marshes. Mm -hmm. We've got to reduce nitrogen, for one thing. Well, and, and fast. Um, Professor Gobler uh, notes that since uh, 1930, yes. we've lost 90% of our marshes 
uh, the Great South Bay, um, and so forth, uh, and that if nothing happens between now and 2030, uh, they'll be gone. They'll be gone. That's right. That's with right. the terrapins. That's right. And the predictions are for Jamaica Bay, uh, with current levels of marsh loss, Jamaica Bay will be marsh free. And, you know, uh, we know even from just Hurricane Sandy just a few years ago that marshes play an incredibly important role in protecting the, the near shore from storm surge and, 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 and the high tides. And the loss of the marshes is a, is a dramatically uh, uh, horrible uh, impact for the, the communities that live near shorelines. Well, that was uh, one of the conclusions made post-Sandy as we talked about what wastewater infrastructure sure. we would bring to Long Island finally with 500,000 cesspools and septic tanks and Absolutely. 197 small sewage treatment plants. Um, taking the nitrogen out increases uh, coastal resilience. Absolutely. And in ecology, you know, we refer to this sort of thing as a state change, where you go from one situation to a dramatically different situation in a short period of time. And, you know, Jamaica Bay's been through a state change because of, of the change, you know, what happened 100 years ago. But we need a state change in terms of the way we treat, treat nitrogen. We need to go from a, a, a whole large community, a, a population that it's mostly based on, on septic systems and switch it over to a community that's based on a, a much more sophisticated ways to deal with nitrogen pollution. Well, I hope that in um, the uh, next uh, decades in your work, uh, you, you will be part of uh, uh, efforts to restore uh, habitat Absolutely. and bring back the, the, the diamondbacks. I was uh, quite impressed in your presentation uh, with the discovery that you made regarding this other population. That's right. And one of the encouraging things about that is that contrary to the way we normally think about turtles, they can respond really quickly to good conditions. So, you know, populations were certainly, you know, uh, dramatically reduced in the early 1900s and then slowly, came, you know, came back again. And um, the Jamaica Bay uh, population in, in, at JFK um, is really just exploded. And, you know, we think about this long period to maturity and low reproductive rates and all that kind of thing. But under the right conditions, turtle populations can explode. And, you know, there's absolutely no reason we can't have that again. You know, no reason we can't build those populations back up again. We don't have to wait 500 years, 300 mm -hmm. years, some unimaginable future it can happen in a couple of decades. Well, that's that's very heartening. I, I grew up, you know, spotted turtles, musk turtles, sure. mud turtles. Um, Let's see what others are on Long Island. Uh, box turtles. Uh, That's right. Snappers, of course. Painted, painted turtles here on Long Island mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so, you know, we have actually a pretty good diversity of turtle species on Long Island. We have several species that are introduced. We find rendered sliders in oh, practically yeah. every pond on Long Island. And they're aggressive, folks. Do not let your uh, pet into the <laughs> That's pond. That's right. They'll push out all the painted turtles. That'll be that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We, we'd prefer that we, uh, everybody uh, uh, keep their painted turtles indoors uh, and, mm -hmm. and not put them out. But, um, you know, we have a great diversity of, of turtles on Long Island and snakes and mm -hmm. other great mm -hmm. wildlife. Um, and, uh, um, and many of those species were covered pretty well if we give them good conditions and opportunities mm -hmm. to do so. Well, speaking of which, there are things that we can do legislatively, as you alluded to. That's right. Uh, there are uh, two pieces of legislation That's right. pending, and, and what should people do? All right, so, so we're kind of in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a middle zone right now. Um, the, the, the state DEC has, been, um, has floated the idea of absolutely closing the harvest on terrapins. And, and I know it, it, to many people it is shocking to think that it is possible for, um, for many people, and, and that's what's happened, for, for people even from outside the United, Sta uh, the United States or outside New York to get permits to collect terrapins and harvest mm -hmm. them for food. And many of these, of course, are ship ship, them out. shipped overseas. That's crazy. And it's amazing when, at, when, on one hand, we're trying to conserve the species, and on the other hand, they're being, they're being uh, harvested well, for food. Well, who, who would possibly say no to that? Well, of course, the people that are doing these harvests are doing it for for money. You know, they they want they have this is part of their income, and they would like to be able to continue doing that. Part of the problem is, of course, that it's compl it's it's very lightly regulated. Uh, we don't know how many they're taking. They, we don't know where they're taking them from. We don't know really much about this industry at all, and it's really not a species that deals well with harvest. Well, uh, there's so many creatures you could talk about that in those terms of horse, horseshoe crabs. Absolutely. So species that, that we already have conservation concerns about, we really shouldn't be taking them out of the wild, especially for something like for food, because, you know, we have lots of other sources of, of food, if that's what mm. you, you know, to, so, so, you know, there's really no need to continue that kind of market. Um, 
you you know uh, that spot around uh, Gilgo Beach. Yes. I was very uh, excited about. There's there's a snack bar um, on Fire Island around Gilgo Beach, and the terrapins come out of the water and they nest. Fortunately, right where they just put a, a kid's playground that no one uses what uh, at all. <laughs> but certainly people will walk back and forth in order to go to the snack bar and. Uh, it would just be such a perfect place to, to uh, set up a nesting area. Every, everything up to that area is bulkheaded, so it's really forcing the terrapins to the first place they can, they can beach and nest. Absolutely. So, you know, we've had many experiences out at Jamaica Bay, uh, which are similar to the sort of thing that you're talking about, where, uh, you know, on a nice day in June, uh, visitors will come out along the trail. It's a nice wide trail. And it's gravel. It's easy to walk on, all that kind of thing. Sit down at a bench, and it's not every single summer at least once and sometimes many times in one summer a visitor will tell us i was sitting at a bench you know having lunch or whatever and a turtle came out of the water uh, looked around and nested at my feet so i sat mm -hmm. and and watched for half an hour now one of the things about terrapins that are, is really unusual among turtles is the whole nesting process is really only about 20 minutes to half an hour sea turtles or box turtles or painted turtles, all these other turtles we're talking about, it's usually three hours, so hmm. you better have a really long lunch if you're going <laughs> to do that. But um, with terrapins, they're in and out in no time at all, and um, I have seen extraordinary photographs and video that people have taken with their toes in the picture because the turtle nested right at their feet, and yeah. I've seen it myself. Well, many, they just get this times. real focus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Once they get you know the, the whole dog and the first egg dropped, you know, earthquakes, tidal waves, you know, pretty much nothing is going to disturb them. Mm. And, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're such amazing, it's such an amazing experience to watch that happen right in front of you. And where else in the world can you go to see something like that? And it's such a, such a beautiful creature, too. I mean, of all the turtles, that to, to my mind, that may right. be the most beautiful. Yep, and you know, and, and in, in any population where you see uh, dozens or you know maybe hundreds in a year, there's lots and lots of variations. Some of them are bright and colorful. Some of them have little mustaches. <laughs> lots of them have the little smile. Yeah, they are they are beautiful creatures. Mm. Well, um, I'll do everything I can to help. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's um, there are a lot of a lot of turtles that I didn't care for well as a kid, and I'm still. Uh, paying penance for that. So. Well, I think a lot of us who kept pets as, as children maybe, you know, can look back and think about things we might have done better. Right. And um, and, and maybe, you know, for a lot of us, you know, the, the things we do now a little bit later have something to do with that, you know, making up for a bit of that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much. I mean, I don't know what it is about turtles that puts a smile on my face. Maybe just looking at them. Yep. <laughs> and, and I consider myself very fortunate to work on a species that, that nearly everybody likes. Mm. Um, even people who harvest them and, you know, are killing them for food, even they treat them generally with some respect. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it, I, it's great that I can walk into any group to, and say I work on turtles. People have turtle stories to tell. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, one, one last question. Sure. I'm curious. You, you, Darwin brought back a, a tortoise to Lon the London Zoo, and I believe it, it died in like uh, 2005, uh, after what, 215 years there. Um, I think I did my math right. Anyhow, it was supposedly 215 years old, let's put it that way. Um, and it died because it had a little uh, bit of damage on its shell, and then uh, an infection eventually got down sure. to its liver. Um, and the, the premise is that turtles um, die uh, not of old age, but of attrition, one and a half percent yeah. per year. Yeah, so turtles, have, you know, they're famous, of course, for their ex extraordinary longevity. And, and among, among vertebrates, they are um, uh, some of the very longest lived. Um, there's some fish that we know that live even longer. But um, they live so long that, you know, once they've reached, they've gone past that vulnerable stage where, you know, some predator might get them or something like that. Mm -hmm. Once they've gotten past that stage, they basically live until an accident or an injury kills mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, they certainly age, you know, they certainly look older and all that. I've seen very old tortoises and they certainly look very old. There's no mm -hmm. question they're aging. And wise. And wise, certainly. <laughs> uh, one presumes uh, that uh, they're, they're, they're uh, uh, getting some wisdom with those years. You can always hope. Uh, they certainly age, but they just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and I was... Um, 
I was in, uh, I've been in the Galapagos a few times and I've seen Lonesome George both when he was alive and I was there just a few weeks after he died. And even George, who did not live particularly long for a Galapagos tortoise, I think he was, uh, you know, he was, you know, uh, in, in his, uh, you know, around 100 or so when he died. Um, uh, died of a, of a of a disease that you know the, of, a, of an injury that led to a disease, and you know if it wasn't for that, he might have lived another two hundred years. And there's certainly mm -hmm. tortoises that have have certainly lived past the two hundred year mark, probably very likely. Well, I hope some of George has been safe for cloning. There's we need to bring those back. Actually, there's great hope that George's species will be saved yet. That's 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 I that's a great note to end. On. I'm very <laughs> right. very happy to Absolutely. hear that. Absolutely. Um, that's going to do it for this edition of Water Matters. Many thanks to our guest, Dr. Russell Burke, and to all of you who tune in to watch the show, because here on Long Island, water matters.